All right, welcome back, everyone. We're just waiting for our panelists to go live, which should happen in just a few moments. While we're waiting, I'll just remind everyone of uh, how the second part of the debate will unfold, hopefully. Um, having had opening statements uh, followed by audience discussion yesterday, um, today we will have responses to the opening statements. Um, the first response will come from uh, Sven Fund, um, and then the uh, other team's response will come from Sybil Geisenheiner. Uh, the opening statements were limited to 10 minutes, and the responses are limited to three minutes. After both responses have been given, we'll have another uh, briefer, because we have less time today, um, period of discussion with the audience. And then when we have a few minutes left uh, in the session, we will retake the poll that we took at the beginning of the debate yesterday, and we'll see uh, whether and if so, to what degree and in what direction the voting changed. And while we're waiting for our panelists to arrive, I'll just ask Charles Watkinson to sing us a song. Charles? Oh, saved. Charles, Charles was saved. We were denied. <laughs> There we are. Excellent. All right, I will uh, start my timer and turn it over to Sven for the first response. Hi all, uh, thank you, uh, Rick. And sorry that I uh, avoided uh, this lovely singing by Charles and probably Anthony in the team here. So after yesterday's statement and the very interesting discussion, we would like to react to Linz and Sibylla's arguments briefly by addressing four major points. First of all, and obviously, there are imperfections to the existing system of research funding and research publication funding. This became clear in Zibillis and Lin's illustrative example of Oxford University's necessary approach to OA funding. It is clear there's hardly ever enough money in the system. But lack of resources rarely, but lack of resources rarely um, does tell us anything about a working system. No machine runs without oil. And the system we argue for is the best that we have. Um, and we do not see how our position would impact the quality of publications as the bill is anecdotal, anecdotally alluded to, precisely as academic publishing today is a system with a high degree of quality assurance. And I think we all agree. That. Secondly, there is no mechanism or rule that today holds research funders back from funding publications directly. But a closer look at the landscape shows, and I'm sure, I'm sure Sibylla and Lynn would agree with this, it is not the case. Why not? This leads to our third point. As we all know, publishing experts tend to put a lot or even too much importance to our own industry. In many conversations I had with funders of research in the past, they almost always cautioned ideas of them getting involved directly into publication funding. Research funders are funding research, and many of them show very little interest in funding research publications, especially certain types like open access or paywalled or whatever system. They believe, as we do, researchers should be free to make the individual publication decisions. Fourth, we heard about a transition from pay to read to pay to publish, a trend we don't see. We believe there is choice for authors of high quality research, either in different colors of OA or paywalled. And one final remark, a question that has only been addressed remotely yesterday. What happens to disciplines and potentially media types like videos or posters that do not receive third party research funding? And since there's much research and the resulting public uh, fund involvement, we are concerned um, much more disciplines will be left behind. I'm afraid that just calling universities funders to evade uh, straight solutions.
then I think we lost uh, we lost the last couple of seconds. Where, did you pause or are you finished? Oh, you're I'm finished. finished. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We know what the music means. All right. Thank you, Sven. Uh, Sybil. Yes. Thank you. So we would like to start by emphasizing that the proposition being discussed is not about who pays for research, but who pays for publishing. And as Lynn pointed out yesterday, if we look at it from the perspective of an employed researcher, there is no such thing as unfunded research. The research is either funded by the researcher's institution, at a minimum through payment of the researcher's salary, a third party or a mix of those. We certainly see the challenges in the research that is not supported by third party funds and have clearly spoken out in favor of them continuing to be supported by their institutions. But where the funding body of the research issues open access mandates, it must be ensured that the costs are covered without putting the scientists between the parties. We are also clearly in favor of preprints. If the funding body feels that the research is complete, with the unedited manuscript, then that would be a solution. But it's not, because funders don't ask for preprints, they demand the version of record as an open access version, in many cases with no embargo period allowed. And this often demand the payment of article processing charges to be compliant. In addition, the other side overlooks the fact that the operation of preprint servers also costs money that must come from somewhere, and overall does not solve the problem of quality assurance. The three major STM preprint servers, ChemArchive, BioArchive, and eArchive, are supported by a combination of scientific societies, institutions, and both non-profit and or commercial entities, depending on the preprint server. The argument that the system should continue to function as it has for the last 150 years is not realistic. The system is not stable, it's in rapid transition, and it's in the transition because many funders, policymakers, librarians, and researchers decided precisely that this is not a functioning system and that we need to face the re realities of a new landscape. Additionally, research funders are already determining which research project to fund. They do this through grants for lab research, equipment, salaries, materials, and more. Our argument that explicitly including funding for publication in those grants would serve to make that research more visible and advance it to the rest of the scholarly community. Publication and the dis disseminating the results of one's research is an essential element of the scientific method, one that, when ignored by funders, breaks the chain of scientific discovery. We could not agree more with the other side's argument that researchers are for sure the best, most knowledgeable ones to choose where their research should be published. But we want to add to this is that researchers now must be empowered again to make that choice in this constantly changing publishing environment. Thank you. That was amazing. She did that in two minutes and 59 seconds. Well done, Sybil. Right, so now um, it's time for discussion with our debaters. Uh, I have no uh, comments or questions in the online chat from our remote audience, so it's down to you in the room uh, here in London to um, pose some questions to our debaters or uh, add some comments of yours to the discussion. or we can go straight to the vote and everybody has 15 extra minutes in their day. I'd be surprised if nobody here has any, has Rick, any comments. Rick, could I add a comment? Yes, I'm sorry, I'm, are you in the room? David Warlock. Oh, David, yeah, sorry. Uh, could we put uh, the debaters back on screen? There we go. Please, David, go ahead. Okay, I wanted to make a comment about, about data. I think that Sven admirably um, summed up why this proposition is um, so dangerous because it leaves so much out. Um, the, uh, the proposition is also dangerous from another point of view, it seems to me. Uh, we're going to come under greater and greater pressure 
uh, to get data available. The whole GoFair movement, uh, and in a recent interview with Professor Baron Munz at, uh, at uh, uh, the University of, uh, of uh, Leiden, uh, he made clearly the point that uh, the data is prime. It has primacy over the article. There can be no article without, uh, without the data, and that the current arrangements for the data uh, uh, and, and its accessibility, uh, outlined in the FAIR rules, findable, uh, accessible, uh, reproducible, uh, sorry, um, interoperable and reproducible, uh, uh, make that very clear. Now, the expectation is that funders and publishers will somehow become responsible for the data. And once again, we will see um, the same uh, um, uh, the same system failures that have been outlined in this debate, uh, and yet the matters will will only get worse because funders will say um, that uh, they do not feel that responsibility, and publishers will say, "Who pays for this?" Indeed, who pays for this has largely led to the problem of data being unaccessible and unshareable. So um, so I think we, we have to take cognizance of the fact of, of change and of renewed and, and uh, deepening pressures. Um, and I think the other area which we have to consider here is what is actually happening to the physical processing of articles. We have not in this debate so far mentioned uh, very much, except at the end of uh, of Sven's uh, uh, commentary, uh, we have not mentioned very much the multi multimedia elements. We have not mentioned very much um, uh, the increasing use of uh, of AI tools in um, uh, in peer review. Not mentioned very much the idea of the living article and perpetual peer review. Things are changing, and we are proposing something about the status of the article in the past. And I think there are dangers there. Thank you. Thanks, David. We have a comment from the floor. Yes, thanks, Rick. And, and it's Andrea Powell here. And it's, it is almost a comment rather than a question, because I went back to look at the wording of the motion, which says the world will be a better place, not necessarily a perfect place, but a better place if research funders, rather than readers and libraries, not authors, and libraries, but readers and libraries, bore the cost of scholarly publishing. And I'm just wondering if the, the speakers have any reflections on whether their arguments really looked at that challenge um, rather than what they were speaking about, whether, whether it makes any difference. Um, if we just reread the words of the actual motion before we finally vote again. Thanks. Any, any response uh, from the debaters? All right, we, have a, we do have another comment from a remote attendee. Uh, sorry? No. Nope. Um, Kimberly Powell says, I was struck by the expansion from my original thinking of the funder definition to include the institution as the funder for the employed researcher. It does seem to make sense that the institution slash employer would have a significant stake in getting research published. But in reality, where would these funds come from and why wouldn't they just be passed back to the library? Anyone on either of the debating teams have a response to that question? So if I may, because, uh, can you hear me through the mask? Just yes. try, perfect, thank you so much. So I'm actually one of those researchers, Uppsala University where I'm located is unusual compared to many universities because there's quite a lot of discretionary funds and various ways of accessing these. And one of the ways that these discretionary funds can be used is for funding research. So being a researcher in Sweden, Sweden has signed various read and publish agreements to sort of solve the problem of piratical APC as long as these agreements 
last. But in general, the policy of the university has been that if you want to, so the university doesn't have open access mandates, but if I wanted to use, uh, to make research that was uh, funded by the discretionary funds that I got from the university for various things, then I had to use that same pot of money to pay article processing charges. And of course, many institutions are moving towards mandating uh, uh, open science and open access. So for example, Georgia Tech, Cambridge, these universities all have very strict mandates it's actually not that different from Plan S. And so basically in such situations, there's been money from somewhere to pay for the research and to pay for the salary. And unless the libraries are willing to actually get involved in read and publish agreements, which is much more of a European than an American thing, but they also need to find a way to pay for, their op for the open access charges or not mandate them. Yes, Sybil. Can I, can I add something? Um, to come back to the point of a better place. Um, what I do think what we suggest would uh, make better is actually the equality point. Because if you think of a funder uh, um, who funds uh, yeah, globally, not in just one country, for example, it wouldn't really matter, for example, if there would be a special agreement in place, like a transformative agreement or something, if really the funder is responsible for for the, the uh, covering the costs of the publishing, it doesn't really matter where the researcher is sitting and if the institution maybe already agreed on an agreement with the publisher or uh, whatsoever. So uh, it would make it easier for researchers really to fulfill the mandates they get uh, through their uh, funders. Thank you, Sybil. Other, uh, any other questions, comments? I, I would, uh, could I make this comment? I would uh, be cautious about putting too much weight upon transformative agreements in the sense that we do not know yet how they will renew, on what terms they will renew, and what the future holds. This is still a very fragile instrument, uh, and believing that uh, that it is going to go on in the same way for a long period of time, I think would be uh, uh, extremely risky. I think I can straight reply because this is what I exactly say. Because uh, if the funder is responsible for the publishing cost, it doesn't matter what agreement is in place between the institution and any publisher. So it's exactly not relying on a transformative agreement system, which I completely agree is a temporary solution to overcome uh, a situation which was yeah, driven by certain funders to, to comply, to, to enable uh, researchers to do comply with those mandates. Good, thank you, Sybil and David. What else? Have we, uh, have we about worn ourselves out on this question? If so, we can, uh, we can go ahead and retake the poll. All right, why don't we go ahead and do that while uh, the poll is being set up. Oh, the poll is already set up. While you are going to the poll, let me remind you, um, Many of you will remember that one of the chief characteristics of a totalitarian society that George Orwell identified was that in a totalitarian society, everything that is not forbidden is compulsory. We have an element of totalitarianism to the debate, and that is that if you didn't vote the first time, it is forbidden for you to vote, to vote this time. If you did vote the first time, it is compulsory for you to vote the second time. Um, so the first round, we had 61 votes in which 56% 50 per, uh, of respondents agreed with the resolution and 44% disagreed. My hope is that we'll have 61 votes again uh, and that we will see some effect of this debate on the distribution of agreement and disagreement. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, make the poll live. I wonder, do I have to do this? 
So, oddly, I see the I see the poll on the conference on the presentation screen, but I don't see it. Sorry. I have to do it on my laptop. Okay. Okay, there we go. It should be active. Yeah, there we go. Okay. And then, uh, do you do you have to? Yeah. You have to enter an answer. Okay. Oh no, I see. I see results coming in. There we go. Still looking for another 19 votes. I feel like Donald Trump. If you could just, if you could just find 19 votes, that's all we need. Let's make researcher to reader great again. <laughs> no, it is. Oh, not not right on President's Day. That's true. Yeah, in case anyone uh, anyone online lost track of the code, uh, go to slido.com and the code is 201693. 201693. Here come a few more votes. All right, it, oh, 50. Doesn't look like we're going to make it quite to 61, but with 50 votes in, we're seeing 46% agreeing, 54% disagreeing, a significant shift from the pre-debate vote, in fact, almost an exact reversal. So the disagreeers, oh, more votes, only making it more clear. <laughs> that the disagreeers have taken the day. All right, would you all please join me in thanking our debaters. And thanks so much to all of you, both here uh, on site and remotely, for your contributions to this very interesting discussion.